From the CUBE studios in Palo Alto and Boston, connecting with thought leaders all around the world, this is a CUBE Conversation. Hi, I'm Stu Miniman and welcome to a CUBE Conversation. Always love when we can dig into practitioner discussions and one of the editorial themes I've been really looking into in 2020 has been the discussion of serverless. So really excited to welcome to the program uh, Dave Anderson, he is Director of Technology at Liberty Mutual, coming to me from uh, Ireland. Dave, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Stu, delighted to be here. All right, so I, I think most of our audience is probably familiar with Liberty Mutual. Uh, you work in, in the software group, Liberty IT is part of Liberty Mutual. Uh, if you could, just start us off, give us a little bit about your background and you know your group's uh, role inside the, the organization. Sure, um, Liberty IT, or so about 20 years ago, is really as a sort of internal software house, part of the Liberty Mutual Group. We're part of Liberty Mutual Technology, so we kind of work across all the markets in Liberty Mutual and all the kind of global locations. Um, my role as kind of director of technology is really think about, you know, what's the technical direction of, of Liberty IT? Um, I kind of lead the architects with, with, with my group and really thinking about, you know, a global architecture of, of, of Liberty Mutual and how can we provide business value in the Liberty Mutual going forward. Excellent. So, Dave, I guess what is the just kind of overall, you know, business and IT relationship? When I think of companies like yours, you know, usually their you know M and A comes in. There, there are growth uh, expansions, and you know, digital transformation has been one of those buzzword discussions. But absolutely, you need to be close to your customer. There's lots of services that you need to uh, provide online. Um, you know, how are some of those overall dynamics? Uh, impacting uh, how IT is supporting the business? That's a great question. I mean, technology has always been the key differentiator for Liberty Mutual, even as my group was, was set up, like I said, 20 years ago. Uh, it was always seen as a, as, a, as a differentiator, as something that we need to kind of be very good at. We've always been quite close to be in the cutting edge of technology. Um, many companies would say, you know, we're not an insurance company, we're a technology company that sells insurance. We are an insurance company. And, and kind of very, you know, that's, that's very important. But we also need to understand how that using the latest technology, i.e. the cloud providers, really helps us deliver value to our, our business partners and customers. So we, it's critical that we have a very tight partnership with our, with our business partners. Excellent, so yeah, 20 years, uh, you know, a lot has changed in that time. Give us a little bit if you can, uh, you know, share a snapshot of where you are uh, kind of in the, the cloud discussion. Um, and you know, what are the relationships between kind of the, the infrastructure side of the team uh, and the development side of the team? And I'm expecting that'll lead us towards the serverless discussion. Sure, I mean, I, I joined Liberty about 12 years ago, 13 years ago, and um, I actually started in a lot of the digital channels, designing systems for the digital channels. And it, probably almost 10 years ago, our CIO, James McLennan, quite visionary, started kind of pressing the, the public cloud agenda and, and, and sort of we started discussing public cloud as a, as a potential future. And uh, it, it was a really exciting time because I think the infrastructure development, we all started to kind of discuss what's the, what's the, the possibilities of public cloud. And as you know, the cloud itself, it, it probably changes every year. It's, it's redefined, there's new capabilities. I'm not sure we could have envisaged where we are today back when we started that conversation. Uh, like every large enterprise, the initial conversations around, you know, how do we enable this? How do we make this safe? How do we protect our data? All, all the usual kind of questions you would have. But you know, we, we kind of really joined together the various different departments. We thought, well, how do we how do we move the, the kind of the enterprise forward? And and as well, I mean, rolling a, a global capability for cloud was very important. And is bringing up kind of velocity that we can deliver value quickly to our business partners. So we we kind of. We didn't do it for technology's sake. We did it to kind of drive it real value for the business. And one of the, the really interesting things that we talked about is we, we shied away from counting how many virtual machines do we have in the cloud. That wasn't really a good metric for us. We say, well, how, how are we delivering value to our, to our business partners? That was the kind of the metric that, that we chase and continue to chase. Well, that, that's excellent how, how you kind of laid that out. Um, I'm wondering if you could help extend that and bring us into you know, where serverless fit into that discussion. I, I loved how you say, it, you know, it's not about, you know, number of VMs or, you know, the, the, the new shiny thing. So, you know, what was it that led to uh, your, your first use of serverless? And, you know, bring us a little bit along that, that journey that you've been going through. 
Sure. Well, one of the things that I've always found critical working in technology is that curiosity, that kind of search for what's next. So within my group, I always charge my people to say, like, you know, where do we need to get to? What is three to five years out? And we have a lot of really fantastic peers right across Liberty Mutual are quite open-minded to, you know, dig and think ahead. Um, so one of my team was at, uh, I think it was reInvent in I think it was 2013, where they uh, launched Lambda in 2014. Um, and he came back really, really excited. And they, they kind of built their first small application. It was actually a document generation. Uh, I think they were using some proprietary system. So they built a document generation solution and couldn't believe the, the, the amount of kind of run cost that was saved. They probably knocked something like 97% off, off their cost. Couldn't believe it. And we, so we started to think, wow, this is potential. But back then, um, you know, again, five, six years ago, the stack was very immature. There was a lot of things you needed to figure out, like your observability, the developer environment. You know, there's a whole bunch of stuff that wasn't quite right. So it's something that we, we share through our peers across the, the, the organization. Um, we, we talked about it. We, you know, we, we really started to kind of think, well, this is interesting, this idea of serverless or a managed service. It started to really change how we thought, and it really started to make the concept of a cloud-native application very real, because we started to think about cloud-native architecture, cloud-native application architecture, and that started to really flip how we thought. So it's just been a real journey this past couple of years, and, and the big thing for me is we, were, we, we started with engineers thinking of cloud as a mindset, not necessarily as a platform. So that opened the door to a lot of possibilities. Yeah, uh, it's it's really interesting that you said that. You know, oftentimes we say you know cloud is an operational model. Uh, you know, not a physical location. Uh, you, are you using multiple clouds today? Yes, we we probably we're trying to have a multi cloud strategy, and and really, I mean, be very clear. Serverless for us, it's not just function as a service. It's not like saying we'll, we're just using kind of something like Lambda. It's really about that idea of using managed service and thinking of an evolutionary architecture. So how can we kind of, you know, try and cut out anything that is effectively not differentiating? There's a great term which I always like is the, the, the stack policy. Is sometimes as technology companies, we get obsessed by the stack and we think that the, the piece near the customer is, is quite easy. I think from a technology perspective, we need to think about, we, need, we can deliver the most value by making the customer experience kind of best and then kind of maybe even rent a stack from, from whoever uh, meets that need. Yeah, no, it, it's really, it's a fascinating discussion. I, I've seen even today, uh, it's, you know, well, what is, you know, you say serverless functions as a service. A lot of it is, I don't want the developer to have to think about those underlying layers, which reminds me of the discussion we've been having about platform as a service for more than a decade, but PaaS was supposed to be, you know, platform independent. So I could have my code wherever it goes, Serverless today, you know, right now, I mean, you talked about Lambda, Amazon, there's certain things that I can only do on Amazon. Uh, there are discussions and working groups and uh, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation working at how we can do, uh, you know, serverless or functions as a service that could span between uh, multiple clouds or use the same sort of code. So how do you look at that space? You know, you talk about, you know, Cloud Native, how do you make sure that you're leveraging the technologies of a specific cloud, but you know, I, I guess I'll throw out not being locked into, uh, you know, any, any one provider. I think about it, for me, it starts with the empowerment of the engineering team. We talk about um, a serverless first strategy. So that means that you've got, to, you've got the capability to build anything you need to, but you'll rent where you can. We had a fascinating story. One of our test stories is a company called, or a, a, a area called WorkGrid, WorkGrid Software is one of the companies that we spun out of Liberty Mutual. That was a project that we had an internal digital assistant that we built with, with some of our teams maybe back four or five years ago. And um, our CEO, James McLennan, decided to fund that as, as, a, as a kind of a startup. So they, they broke off around three years ago. And um, that initial team had four people on that engineering team. So they kind of decided that they would be serverless first in their approach. So they didn't have time to think about operability or you know right for portability. They had to realize business value really quickly. So if it so and they they took an evolutionary architecture approach, which meant they kept incrementing and iterating and delivering value where possible. Like what's the next best thing they can build to deliver value for the customer? So when you think in that regard, 
if you ever come to a, an Amazon of a great talk about no one-way doors, keep a two-way door, don't lock yourself into anything, make decisions that you can always build upon. So with that kind of, you know, constant iterative work of our teams and that serverless first strategy, it means that when you do rent a service, if you need to change to another service, it's just a matter of, you know, if you've got your boundaries set up correctly, it's, it's fairly easy to get out of that. You dig yourself in deep to something, then that's a difference. So I think there's, there's, there's an engineering mindset and, and, and culture that, would, that we certainly have bred with in our teams that they kind of go fast, focus on business value and kind of, you know, uh, and, and, and try and be sort of cloud native in their outlook. Excellent. Yeah, that, that uh, I just heard Andy Jassy in the uh, AWS Summit online keynote talking about those one-way versus two-way doors. So, sounds like from your standpoint, serverless uh, is a two-way door for, for architecting in your mindset? Absolutely. And I mean, I think it's really, for me, it's, it, it, it brings architecture back into the team. Because one of the really nice things is if your team are you know, using managed services, that focuses on business value. If our infrastructure is set up to support that type of team, then you have minimal handoffs within the team. So you have a single team, it's their job to you know, create value, engineer the solution, make sure the security is good enough, do the operations, the visibility, it's all contained within one team. So you get a huge responsibility from that one team. As an engineer, that is super powerful, and super um, huge autonomy. Um, so we, we can talk with the serverless engineer. And for me, it's been absolutely fascinating to see teams Come into this environment, and once they understand, you know, that event-driven way of, of 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 creating their systems, and I use the word systems rather than applications, to create the event-driven systems, they're constantly kind of building upon. It's just fascinating to see where they go. It's you start to see the creativity and innovation from the engineers. So it it it's it's truly really, it's unbelievable to watch. It really very cool. Yeah, Dave, Dave, I'm curious when you look at uh, the application portfolio that that your team manages. How do you decide what goes serverless? Is it you know new development? All goes serverless. If there's been a migration, uh, you know how, how do you look at the overall uh, application portfolio that you have? Sure. Well, it, it kind of depends, I suppose. On I mean, I'm not going to sit here and say that we're going to refactor everything to serverless. You know, I think when you do a migration, you have your you know your uh, there's, there's usually six or seven paths you can go down, and you do what what's best for the business. But for new development, it's definitely interesting. We haven't found many use cases that are, are really a bad fit. It's a spectrum. So you may decide, you know, what different service do you use? Um, we, we built a system last year, which was absolutely fascinating to see. Um, it's like a, a financial um, kind of aggregation system where we do a lot of our accounting. So um, it was a kind of, uh, I call serverless ETL. We're trying to run like an end of month batch system. We take a lot of accounts from different countries and kind of pipe them into a kind of general ledger. Um, not something I would have thought about for serverless, to be honest. But then when you think about it and some of our, our kind of engineering needs, as they put this together, they kind of designed this fantastic system using serverless workflows because uh, you're taking lots of various different types of data, orchestrating them into a single destination. And we, we've went live with that this year. And I think one of the month of ends that they recently ran, I, I think they ran something like 100 million transactions. Uh, costing relatively low cost. And of course, being a, a month-end system, the rest of the month, there's zero cost. You don't pay for idle. So you only actually pay for while it's running in that month-end process for maybe you know maybe a few hours or something. Yeah, uh, Dave, you, you talked about the in the early days, 2014, when Lambda was announced to reinvent, when you first started using it in the first year or so, there's the maturity of that, that ecosystem solution set. Where do you see things now? You know what's working well. What's on your wish list uh, to kind of mature or increase overall functionality to to help? I think the the developer environment and the developer experience is is a big part. One of the key messages I've been trying to kind of get into the the, the into our culture is um, code is a liability. It, it's not an asset. If you have a bunch of engineers writing lots of code. That effectively is a liability. There's no business asset in that. The asset is in the system that you create. So trying to get engineers into the mindset to write less code and they actually engineer systems. You know, So one of the things that we've been trying to do is maybe using patterns as building blocks, get people into kind of like a Lego building block way of, of, of creating the, their, their systems. We're so using some things like um, CDK, Cloud Development Kit patterns, um, using the well-architected process to make sure that 
and teams are looking after their their, their cost, their security, their performance, their reliability, and their their kind of optimizations. Um, it's so it's it's some of those things are, are really important that teams that hold ownership of you know operational view of their systems, and also even things like observability. Um, when you when you create a system with a lot of events flying around, it starts getting complex. Um, but then you can kind of if you do that correctly, you can start to layer on well what what data insights can we build on top of the system? So it's really opening up teams to a, a different way of working. And then, of course, there's lots of operational challenges when you get into more complex environments. So as, as we often say, it's it's not easier, different. It's still difficult to build these systems, but it's different. Uh, so it's definitely easier, but better. All right. Uh, how about anything that you're looking out to, towards the future? You, you talked about you know the early days when you, you uh, you know, look at these, and while you're not necessarily, you know, throwing the latest shiny thing into production, uh, there's that that curiosity. So, what, what's what's exciting you now? Uh, anything else, uh, kind of looking forward uh, for that, that you could share? I think, I mean, um, one of the one of the fantastic success stories we've had is with um, a project we called Virtual Assistant, and and, and really to answer your question. It's about how teams can properly work at MVP. So. One of the things that we really find fascinating is when you put a good engineering team, and I mean a team who are really solid engineers, we then layer on the cloud and security best practices, potential certification. We then put them in a supported service environment with a real business problem. They then create an MVP. So our virtual assistant team created an MVP where they would start to, um, so if you call into a, a, a call center and you have a fairly straightforward request, like um, say, you know, if you have an auto, claim, you might say, well, when can I pick up my rental if you've already done your claim? Um, we have an NLP, a natural language assistant, that can help you out with that conversation. So when you start to write MVP systems like that, you can start them off at a fairly small traffic until you actually tune that until it's, it, it's kind of perfect. And then you can gradually scale up and add on other you know, data-driven potential AI services, um, you know, integrations through that. So I think we, when you start to take that MVP approach and have a very, very narrow solution, see what that's like in, in the wild, and then start to scale that up. I mean, we, we scale that system from taking maybe 30 calls, to maybe taking a quarter of a million calls. So it's, 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 it's fantastic how you can start to scale these systems up. So I think what I'm really looking for is more kind of support to see how we can, you know, it's, it's the art of the possible. How can we use this, this tool set and this serverless mindset to create really fascinating, you know, you know business applications, because when you get into that, that kind of um, creative conversation with business partners, I mean, they, they don't want to hear about Lambda or events or observability. They want to say, well, what can I do with AI? What can I do with voice? What can I do with vision? You, know, you start to open up really fantastic um, you know, conversations like that. So I, so I think that's, I, I'd like to see more of that, that kind of creative product development. Excellent. Well, yeah, Dave, so important that you, you brought back as to how, you know, IT and the business working together. It's, it's not about, you know, the, the technical, uh, you know, widgets and knobs or anything, but, you know, the, the, the services and the value that ultimately you can provide for the business and, uh, you know, the impact that has on your ultimate end customer. All right, Dave, thanks so much. Real pleasure having a chat with you. Thanks, Stu. Really appreciate it. Thank you. All right, be sure to check out thecube.net, lots of uh, backgrounds. If you go hit the search, you can actually type serverless, find out more uh, about what we've been covering as well as what events we will be at in the future. I'm Stu Miniman, and thank you for watching theCUBE.